I went into the shop the other day, a local specialized shop, just to pick up a new chain. All they carried though was Dura Ace, which of course is pretty expensive. I did some math in my head to figure out how many hours I would need to work to pay for the chain, and I just declined and left the shop. Ordered this one online instead. But as I left the shop, I felt some embarrassment about not forking out the cash for a Dura Ace chain. But that disappeared. That feeling disappeared when I realized that we shouldn't be normalizing that kind of spending behavior in the sport. That experience inspired me to make a series of videos on endurance cycling on a budget, trying to optimize for high performance while spending as little money as possible. In this video, the Budget Overbiked series will begin, and we are going to look at the bike itself as our first topic. Uh, bike handling and fit are two critical characteristics for choosing a bike that are actually just free to manufacture. So if the bike falls within your use case, the handling characteristics will fall within a pretty narrow and acceptable range. Instead, it just needs to fit you uh, with just a few minor tweaks. Budget bikes do an excellent job with this because they always come with a standard two-piece stem and handlebar system that allow for cheap, easy and fast small changes uh, to accommodate fit. Even with high adjustability found on budget bikes, uh, getting a bike fit before purchase is still a great idea and a solid investment. This is a hedge against having to sell and rebuy a bike, which can itself be very expensive to do. Many budget-minded shoppers find the prospect of paying for this service to just be unacceptable though. If this is you, at least find a shop that offers a basic assessment to find the correct size frame, even if uh, smaller details like handlebar width or crank length need to be sorted out independently. My brother and wife both bought new, locally branded, and very low-priced road bikes from nearby shops. Mid-size and regional brands often offer respectable designs and constructions at very competitive prices. Mega brands like Giant and Merida do pretty well at this too. These days though, the second-hand bike market is just awash with super cheap rim brake road bikes because the masses are moving to disc brakes. Uh, you can use this as a great opportunity to get a high-spec bike for a very low price. Fit tuning and problem solving come next. Uh, this is one of the costs of avoiding a full-blown bike fit. Setting saddle height and angle and saddle setback are the best starting points. Other touchpoint characteristics and locations can be determined afterwards. This often means adjusting or swapping saddles, stems, handlebars, and sometimes even crank length. For my brother, the stock saddle desperately needed to be replaced. Pressure from the stock saddle didn't allow forward hip rotation and forced a bowed lower back. My wife's bike also needed a floppy saddle to be replaced. I flipped the stem, rotated the handlebars, and adjusted the controls to be higher and closer. Crank length and handlebar width were well out of line. Hip tightness and splayed out wrists were just a few of the side effects from these poor sized components. $55 bought a 36 centimeter handlebar and 152 millimeter crank arms that are more appropriate. She reported that the changes made make riding the bike feel like a completely different activity. I've noticed a big uptick in her speed as well, even though she's now in a more upright position. Being constrained by a budget often means lusting after the unaffordable. Enter the carbon frame. Uh, for those who have never owned one before, there's often a mystique around the qualities of a carbon frame. And don't get me wrong, they're good, but they're not magic. And I don't recommend budget-bound cyclists prioritize carbon frame as a use of their resources. Metal frames are great too, and they have important budget-friendly qualities. First, they're just much cheaper. Very cheap carbon bikes, like from AliExpress or even my Polygon, is still more expensive than reputable metal bikes, even before factoring in the risk of buying from AliExpress. Respecting a tight budget means avoiding risk and uncertainty. Next, metal can take dings and minor mishaps better than carbon. Carbon holds up really well to miles, but drops and crashes are more likely to lead to unplanned repairs and replacements. Expenses like this are exponentially harder to manage when money is already tight. There's enough of these kinds of things happening in regular life already. We don't need to add those uh, in our cycling hobbies. A minor benefit of metal frames is that they should have better tolerances on press fit bottom brackets, and they use threaded bottom brackets that are not bonded into the frame. They also use more common standards and fewer proprietary parts than carbon frames. This will improve service life over time. 
For performance, metal bikes do give up a little bit to carbon, but the difference isn't huge, and the difference is also context dependent. Metal bikes can be had with modern features and a neat appearance of high-end models. Wider tires and modern construction like hydroforming can slim the comfort and weight gaps too. In a competitive context, it's very easy to justify buying a carbon bike. Carbon bikes will perform better in an absolute sense, but when you're on a budget, the return on investment is really poor, especially when metal frames these days are so good. At $450 pre-COVID and $700 during COVID, these aluminum bikes are very sensible. Speaking of return on investment, tires are probably the single most important equipment choice you can make for cycling performance. They offer reduced energy output or faster speeds all day long. Between a slow gator skin and a fast GP5000 STR, we can estimate about 20 watts saved or a few extra kilometers per hour. We can also think of it as saving over 300 calories per 100 kilometers ridden. Bikes costing thousands often come with slow tires, so you can imagine what's equipped on low-cost models. Splashing out for GP5000 tires is still a bridge too far on some budgets, though. So you can cross-reference current prices with tools like BicycleRollingResistance.com to find out which high performers are the lowest cost. To get the most out of good tires, you have to run at appropriate pressures for your weight and the road conditions. This Goldilocks pressure balances general resistance versus the dreaded impedance spike when conditions are too rough for the tire to handle at a given pressure. I recommend the SRAM Axis or Silka Tire Pressure Calculators, starting with the lowest pressure recommendation between the two. My brother needed high pressures to avoid pinch flats on his stock 23mm tires, resulting in a really rough ride and lots of time above the impedance spike. To change, he maxed out his frame clearance with 25mm GP4000 and GP5000 tires running tubes. He can run these at a reasonable 85 PSI, just below the Silka recommendations. This was a massive upgrade for speed and performance, and even though the bike was very cheap, it feels legitimately impressive now. My wife is much lighter and could be fine with the stock 23mm tires, but much faster 25mm Continental Ultra Sports allow for a plush 70 psi and a lot more grip. Upgrading thick stock tubes can boost performance for very little money. Cheap Conti race light tubes offer really good improvements and nearly match more expensive latex and TPU tubes for rolling resistance. If you choose to do this, the stock tubes can be repurposed as spares, which you would need to buy anyway. That makes this an incredibly cost-effective upgrade. Wheels are often the Achilles heel of low-cost bikes. For performance, they weigh a ton, and they don't have any helpful aerodynamic properties. As far as durability goes, many of them are made with poor quality cup and cone bearing seals, and the grease just gets washed away, and then the bearings destroy the races. Instead, prioritize wheels like my brother's, with Shimano hubs which have high quality cup and cone seals. Hubs with replaceable cartridge bearings are also a safe choice. Check free hub lubrication often, as these seals are often quite poor too. Wheel trueness and spoke tension tend to leave cheap wheels more quickly, so inspection should be a regular maintenance task. If cared for, even low-cost wheels, if they have quality seals, can perform admirably for years. Rim brakes haven't disappeared. They're actually dominating at the lower price points these days. They're half a kilo lighter or more, they result in a cheaper bike at the same component spec, and they often perform better than cable-actuated disc brakes. We don't need to have concerns with poor quality braking surfaces because budget bikes are going to be using alloy wheels. The main downside of rim brakes is tight tire clearance, but also be wary of flexi unbranded calipers. As a heavy all-weather rider who's doing a lot of elevation change, uh, wet weather braking performance and wider tires are a priority to me. Also, because I'm heavy, uh, the weight of the bike has less of an impact on me than it does for a lighter rider. As such, disc brakes are really suitable for my use case, and they may be for you too. Budget and mid-range cable actuated disc brakes are simply not very good though. SRAM Apex, Shimano Tiagra, and GRX400 are the cheapest reputable group sets with hydraulic brakes on drop bar bikes. But they do require higher budgets than rim brake bikes. Having owned all three, I can recommend them easily, especially GRX400. A matching bleed kit, fluid, and a disc alignment tool should be budgeted and considered mandatory. Hopefully in the near future, Shimano Qs can introduce some budget-friendly drop bar hydraulic disc brakes, uh, but for now, 
Rim brakes are going to be a no-brainer for our lightweight test subjects. Like carbon frames, high-end group sets have an undeserved mystique from those who don't have access to them, and they're a poor use of limited resources. The benefits of weight, shifting speed under load, and even ultra-fine gearing jumps are not critical for endurance riding like they are in competitive riding. Also like carbon frames, the low-cost emulations of top-tier kit doesn't seem to meet the low expectations for quality that have been set, much less approach mainstream brand reliability. Until a proven record of longevity and quality is established, these are too risky to recommend. Instead, reliable entry-level gearing already does exist. 8 to 10 speed components from Shimano aren't exciting, but they are durable. SRAM has mostly exited this market, but Apex 11 speed and their other old components are still quite suitable. Consumable parts from these group sets being cheap help save money when you need to refurbish a secondhand bike, and it saves a lot of money over the lifespan of the bike too. Check out my video on gearing to see what ratios suit your riding needs. Both bikes here came with 2x8 Shimano Claris with a compact crank set and an 1130 cassette. My brother is thin and prefers flat terrain, so stock gearing is more than adequate. My wife wanted easier climbing gears, so I added a $25 1134 cassette. She also keeps a chatting pace with great conviction, rendering the big ring clean enough to eat from. The shorter crank arm uses a little one by chain ring, matching her style and shaving almost a pound from the bike. Small details come down to personal preference and style. These bikes are finished with flat pedals for normal shoes, but SPD mountain bike pedals or Look Kio road pedals are both great options on a budget and they help avoid getting whacked in the shins. So to sum up, an ideal low cost bike should be designed to match your riding conditions first. Fit and gearing requirements should be able to be met with just a few small changes, but you should expect to make some of those changes to get the bike perfectly suited to you. Uh, the tire system is the best place to spend money on upgrades for a faster, easier rolling bike. Do be careful though about the quality of wheels supplied on budget bikes. I hope this video was helpful for you to prioritize where to spend your money and where to save your money to get a high performance budget bike. But more importantly than that, I hope that endurance cycling can be a more inclusive sport for those of all incomes. So with that, ride safe everyone and see you in the next video.